people. Right. Thanks a lot, Andreas, and thanks also, Francisco, for organizing this. Um, obviously, not you know having this weekly thing rather than meeting in person and being able to go out for a meal after the talks and things is a sort of small consolation only but it is one you know it's nice to be able to to share our research remotely in any case um andreas was just saying that you know a lot of people have given a bit of an overview thing and i actually decided to do I think originally I had given a title which was about PT symmetric chaos or something like that, but I decided to actually do talk about a specific model in the end, uh, one which has been in the making for very, very long. So um, I think we started work on that when my student, Steve, who was a central part of his PhD student, when he started his PhD, which um, was probably in 2000. 14 or something like that. So it's been a long time in the making and a lot of you have been hearing me speaking about several of these bits. But finally, we've kind of wrapped most of it up and we understand quite a lot. There's still a lot of open questions, but there's probably enough that we understand to, to talk to you about this. So just many of you, oops, what's going on? So many of you have met Steve, but those of you who haven't, that's Steve. He's now actually in the real world. He finished his PhD and decided to um, become a machine learning engineer at a then startup company. I think they're pretty big now, actually, um, but a London-based data and data science um, company. Um, that's how my group looked in 2018. So nowadays, unfortunately, group meetings don't look quite like that. They look a bit more like this, as you can imagine. My daughter has made me a Lego model of my group as well to remind me on my desk <laughs> of how that there is a group there. But yeah, hopefully there'll be better times sometime soon where we can all do science together again. Um, right, uh, I'm jumping right in, it seems, which actually a bit confusing. Let me just see. Where is my, well, Apparently my summary slide is missing here. Um, oh no, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, did, I did look at that earlier and I already forgot again. So I just have two taster slides and then I actually have my slide of my outline. So um, I don't really have to make many words about PT symmetry here. And we've had some excellent introductions into PT symmetry in the last um, couple of months in this seminar. Um, just sort of to, to get everyone on the same page with maybe what I have in mind there. So, you know, when I say PT, um, of course, the name um, coined by Carl and others um, sort of had in mind this idea of parity and time reversal. But as, as we know, there are other systems having similar features. There, there are many other vocabularies for it. So, you know, pseudo-hermeticity and very other things that are all subtly different. But let me just sort of say that PT, but what I have in mind is a sort of fairly general anti-unitary symmetry of my system, okay? So as an example here, just a two-level model with PT symmetry that many of you have seen hundreds of times, versions of this, obviously, there are lots of different ways to call your parameters, where we have two levels, one has a um, positive imaginary energy, and the other one has a negative imaginary energy, they're coupled by what might be, in this case, a real, it's assumed to be a real parameter, V, and um, you can interpret this sort of as an effective open system, if you wish, where one, uh, one of the levels would grow exponentially, the population, and the other one would decay exponentially. But as long as this gain and loss is balanced and is not too big compared to the coupling between these two levels, we know that eigenvalues can be purely imagined, uh, can be purely real, and can have stable modes in this system, even though there's something growing and decaying. There are modes that don't show any growth or decay in their time evolution. And the PT symmetry in that would be the P is a parity in the sense of interchanging the two states. And the T is the simple um, complex conjugation in that case. So just as an example. But we know there's a lot of stuff going on in PT. I don't really need to show you anything about the successes of PT because we've seen a lot of that in this seminar series. Um, one thing that hadn't been looked at that much um, so far was actually the connection to chaos. I mean, it is definitely coming up and I am not attempting to 
give a list of everyone who has looked, but it has been sort of among all the things that had been looked at, it had been a little bit um, neglected, perhaps. I'm not quite sure why this isn't working, but I can just click on it. So let me just say a few words about quantum chaos. Obviously, I could give you a whole lecture on that for those who, who are not so much into quantum chaos so far, but if you're not, then hopefully you're just getting a little bit of flavor of what it's about here. I mean, the general idea of the field, I guess, is the idea that classical physics is actually quite generically chaotic. So the idea of chaos there is really the um, idea in the classical sense that two initially closed trajectories diverge, exp well, it deviate exponentially from each other. So over time, just because two things were initially similar, as time evolves, they can be very, very different, right? So we know that in this sense, in the traditional interpretation, there's no chaos in quantum dynamics because quantum dynamics has a linear equation of motion, and um, which means that the distance of two states, if you wish, always remains unchanged over time evolution. So if you had initially a small difference, it will also propagate a small difference. Of course, there are slightly other um, takes on this. You can ask what exactly one means with the difference of two outcomes in quantum mechanics and so forth. But that was sort of the origin of the whole idea that got people interested in the question of quantum chaos or as Michael Berry, for example, likes to call it quantum chaology, because as I just said, there isn't really chaos in that sense in quantum mechanics. This isn't necessarily the question, this question of, you know, how come that quantum mechanics is the fundamental theory or the more fundamental theory of the world, but it doesn't show chaos, whereas in this sort of macroscopic description, we, we encounter chaos and we see it everywhere around us. Um, so this question has actually been slightly less investigated in, in the, the field of quantum chaos, but what has been investigated is what are the features of a quantum system whose classical counterpart is chaotic as compared to regular? Okay, so if I take the head off the Hamiltonian, I look at the classical Hamiltonian function and Hamiltonian dynamics could be regular or chaotic or mixed, obviously what is the difference? Are there any differences among these quantum systems? And there are various answers to that and a lot of well-identified and well-understood fingerprints of chaos in quantum systems. And what's surprising is in some ways, this is a very foundational research, but it has a lot of surprising applications um, in, I keep on doing that, sorry, I'm <laughs> pressing the wrong button. Let me try here. Um, in, in all sorts of places. So one of them, for example, is, um, pure mathematics. So in quantum chaos, you very quickly encounter a connection to random matrices. We're going to get there as the talk progresses as well. <laughs> Unless I continue that pace, then we're not going to get anywhere. But um, so random matrices are very, very closely connected um, to quantum chaos, but they're also very closely connected to a lot of developments in pure mathematics and in particular number theory. So there's this deep connection to the statistics of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function and a lot of other zeta functions and don't ask me details about it, but there's a whole industry using quantum chaos developed techniques to actually calculate a lot of things that number theorists wish to calculate and don't have another way to do. Um, quantum magnetic is another example, which is also probably a foundational topic, but there's sort of a big question, of course, about thermalization in quantum systems and one of the big contenders to actually explaining anything about that, I don't know to which degree it really explains, but one of the sort of mechanisms one looks at is the so-called quantum magnetic, the idea that in a classically chaotic system in the quantum counterpart, um, a typical state would be completely spread out over the available phase space or Hilbert space, so that over time, systems evolve into an equilibrium even though they're not open. There's a thermalization in a closed quantum system. So quantum chaos feeds a lot into these ideas. Another very practical application of it is so billiards play a big role as, as model systems in quantum chaos and they are actually in other fields, not quantum but in, in, in classical optics and in other things, um, play a big role too. And micro disk lasers, for example, are basically quantum billiards that are um, where light escapes 
and where the features of the, the quantum billiard are used to um, lead to particular patterns of light and properties of lasers that are desirable. So there are a lot of applications of these fields, but so far there hadn't been that much um, on PT symmetry in chaos. There's been some, but not a lot. So um, with this in mind, we started investigating the kick top because that's one of the standard models of conventional Hermitian or unitary quantum chaos. It's a standard model for various reasons because in some ways quantum chaos always emphasizes the idea of universality, you know, that things are the same in all systems you might look at, but in fact most systems are very, very, have very system specific properties. So the kick top is actually one of the few that actually really has a lot of the properties that you generally expect from chaotic systems, you know, when it comes to random matrices, when it comes to typical dynamical behavior and so forth. So it's a, it's a favorite one of many people in the field and it seemed a nice one to generalize. So the outline of my talk is going to be that I'm trying to review very briefly some properties of the standard commission unitary, it's unitary in that case it's a map obviously, kick top to just set the scene that's obviously all very well known old results. Um, then I move forward to just show you how we introduced the PT symmetry kick top which is really just a toy model at that point, even though if you were particularly insistent on it, I'm pretty sure it can be realized in a lab, but there are probably other PT symmetric chaotic things that are very more natural to, to actually realize, but this one is a very natural to theoretically understand. So I'm gonna to come to in, um, introducing that, and then I show you what the classical system the classical counterpart of this PT symmetric kick top is doing in phase space. And then we come to the quantum, some of the quantum features and how they actually link to the classical features, hopefully. <laughs> right, so um, if you do want to interrupt me with a question, you've read the code of conduct, if I get that right. Um, yeah, Andreas has just already said that in the chat. So if you have a question, do raise your hand, like try to do it with a with the app version, the virtual hand, not your real one, because we might not see you, um, and or write something in the chat, but I won't be looking at it, so don't send me a private message if you want me to react to it right now, but the others are going to keep an eye out for me, so that um, if there's a question, we can interrupt any time better than saving it up and you know not knowing what's going on. Right, let's start with the standard kick top. I keep on doing this beeping noise, sorry. I need to move you guys now. You're in the, you're in the way. Here you are. Right, so this is the Hamiltonian. It's one of the Hamiltonians. The, the kick top, you can, there, there's a lot of parameters you can change and lots of directions you can choose or whatever, but this here is a pretty standard version of it. So you have a linear angular momentum operator with, in this case, I put it in, in one particular direction and then you have a nonlinear term here which is only switched on at discrete delta kicks okay so it's you can choose this one to go into the z direction and then this one in principle you could have a third direction but it doesn't really change much of the physics so typically you look at it in um, dependence on these three parameters here where p and epsilon are this rotation axis of the linear system and then the k is the strength of the kicking which is also the strength of the um, chaos, as we will see later. So the larger K, the larger the chaos, basically. So this here is a time-dependent um, Hamiltonian system, but really most of the information about the time evolution is really encoded just in the propagation of a one kicking period. So rather than looking at this, what it does for all times, it's very natural to go to a Floquet uh, representation and just always look at the system every period of kicking. So you can look wherever you wish. You can look just before a kick, just after a kick, just right in between the kicks or anything, as long as it's always the same place, right? So every period T um, or tor in that case here, um, you're looking after the same time. So this is then described by the Floquet operator F, which is the time evolution operator over that time tor. And here I've written that down in a way, I just noticed, I've given that a few times, but I haven't fixed it yet, in a way that goes from just 
after a kick to just after the next kick. I think the pictures I show you are for halfway between the kicks. So pictures will rotate a little bit if you change the window at which you look, but they're all um, related to each other by a unitary transformation. So there's no other physics going on, depending on where you look. Okay? You're not gonna discover chaos if you look from just after the kick to just after the next, and there's no chaos from between to between. Right, so if it's chaotic, it's chaotic no matter how you look, but there are some subtleties in how it's rotated. Right, so this is this Fluke operator, and um, a state is then propagated from period to period by application of this Fluke operator. So this is what we tend to call a quantum map, right? Because this is a recursive um, map that just maps a state at one discrete time to a state at a later discrete time. So rather than looking at a Schrödinger equation, we're looking at this discrete map here. So psi time one, two, three, four, and so forth. So you can realize a system like that, for example, in ultra cold atoms um, that's been done already in 2009, where they used the individual spin of cesium atoms, which is like a hundred whatever large spin. <laughs> so it's a fairly large one. Um, there are other ways of realizing systems like that, even though in the beginning when, when Fritz Hake and co-workers introduced this, um, it was very much a toy model. And I think in the 90s, Fritz wrote a paper um, on, which was entitled, Can the Kick Top Be Realized? And there was sort of a big question mark and there were very various things that might do it. And the cold atoms weren't on the menu at all at this point. Um, so later on, you know, now it is one of these realizable models, but to start with, it wasn't, just sort of to point that out. It was really, um, introduced as a, as a toy model. Right, so what does this thing do? Um, so the, yeah, I need to move you again, sorry. Um, classical dynamics. Right, so the classical dynamics of that Hamiltonian is simply evaluating the classical dynamics, so canonical equations of motion. But since this is an angular momentum system, it's pretty natural to look at it in angular momentum space, right? So you look at these three operator, or three, three classical variables, which I call SX, YZ, in contrast to these quantum ones, LX, YZ. Um, so they, I've been normalizing them so that they live on a Bloch sphere. So, um, and this classical dynamics is what you would get, obviously, if you take the head of the operator and you evaluate Hamilton's equations of motion, but it's also the semi-classical limit that you get from the dynamics if L goes to infinity. Um, so usually in the, in the literature, that's not specified too closely in which way exactly you get that limit because for unitary dynamics, you can basically do whatever you wish and you always end up with the same classical thing. Um, we have to be a little bit more careful in the non-emission case of what exactly we mean by that. I come back to that. So the um, bit with the P and E, so the three evolution between the kicks, that's simply a rotation around the axis in this P zero epsilon direction, okay? So it's just a rigid rotation. Um, so the kick itself then is the torsion around the z-axis because you can interpret this LZ squared term as a rotation around the z-axis with an angle LZ. So the angle is proportional to where you are on the sphere. If you're on the top, you rotate a lot in this direction. If you're in the bottom, you rotate a lot in the other direction. If you're on the equator, you don't rotate at all. So it's a torsion of the sphere. You're only doing that at every delta time, but because it's a delta peak, you know, you get a quick torsion. Yeah, please. So the dynamics is regular if this k parameter is small. Obviously, it's fully regular if it's zero. And then slowly chaos sets in, and for very large kicking strength, um, it becomes almost fully chaotic. Um, I show you a picture here, which is actually not the typical picture you usually see, but it will come back later. So I wanted to show you that already. You're immediately going to recognize it in later on, but I hadn't been seeing that picture before and I didn't recognize it. So I want to prime you for that. So what I show you here is actually the image of the great circle, one of the great circles, under the map. So I take this great circle and every point I propagate with one iteration of my map for a particular kicking strength k equals seven. So what I'm seeing is exactly this effect of this torsion. So you also see a little bit of the rotation, which is just the fact that it's not um, exactly along the, that the, the axis of this spiral isn't exactly the z-axis. But otherwise, mainly you see the kicking bit, which just gives you this spiral. And the longer, the larger k is, the more 
bind, bound up that is. Okay, the binding number gets larger from the K. So here you wouldn't really see whether that's chaotic or not. It only becomes chaotic if you do the map many, many times, right? So then you actually see the, uh, well, it's chaotic anyway, but then you see the chaos unfolding. So the more familiar pictures you see um, are of that kind, where I see show you a Poincaré map, where I take a number of initial points. They're not completely um, randomly chosen in this particular one. I put them sort of nicely along the equator somewhere. And then I propagate each of these points for many, many time steps. I don't remember for how many, enough to get a pretty picture, basically. And you see that when K is small, you get something that looks pretty regular. You get this of closed orbits. When K gets larger, there's these regions coming up, which are actually the regions of chaos. And when K is very large, this almost looks ergodic. You know, in mathematics, it's sort of a strong statement to say something is ergodic. This isn't fully ergodic. There are lots and lots of tiny islands that are regular. These, you know, the leftovers of all these guys, right? But they're so small that for all practical purposes, this is a fully chaotic system. Okay? So I show you that all on the blosphere. And also, sometimes it's easier to see everything if you just take a Mercator projection of a sphere. So basically, these are the canonical variables. So it's the Z direction and then the angle along, along the, so it's, it's like cylindrical coordinates, but they happen to be canonical coordinates for that system. So they're quite useful, this um, projection that you see down here. So this has obviously all been known since the 80s, how that looks, but just to show you some of these pictures for reference in what we're gonna do in the moment. So the kick top, as I said, in the quantum system is also very faithful to everything you would kind of expect from quantum chaotic systems. One signature of chaos is actually how the Hosimi functions of these eigenstates, the Floquet states, you know, they're the counterpart of stationary states. They, they reproduce up to a phase after every iteration. Um, so they mimic classical structures in phase space. And I just show you two examples. I don't even, didn't even bother to write the particular parameters, but there's one example here where there's just a random state, um, randomly selected state, it's not a random state, that's important, of um, a system which is almost integrable. So the K is very small. We have an epsilon. Everything's like rotated a little bit. And this is just corresponding to a stable orbit of that. Let me see. It would be corresponding to this system, but it's rotated a little bit. So I picked an epsilon non-zero so that the axis around which everything happens is slightly different. But here you can see a circle of that type. So all the quantum states in a system like this, they would all, if you plot their Hosimi distributions in phase space, which is basically the best you can do if you want to show the probability of P and Q at the same time. Obviously, you can't do that because of Heisenberg's uncertainty, but the best one of the best ways to do it is the Hosimi representation, and they would all be lying on these circles. And the larger your angular momentum number, more of these circles you can resolve. Um, if it's chaotic, system will look like this. So this picture is just one of the Floquet states that corresponds to this um, classical dynamics. You can really see, again, th there are some patterns. It looks as if they're patterns, but it has been shown that these things are pretty much random vectors. On the, on the sphere. So you can see the chaos or regularity in the quantum eigenstates and these stationary states. And another very common thing to look at is the eigenvalue statistics. So you look at these, um, the statistics of the quantum eigenvalues. In this case, again, it's the eigenvalues of this Floquet operator we're looking at. So they are, they're, to start with, they are angles, right? So they, they lie on the unit circle in the complex plane. But we can calculate quasi energies out of them by taking the logarithm of these things. And um, there's been very, two very important conjectures in quantum chaos. Both of them are actually still conjectures. You know, there isn't really proof for either of these things, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of evidence that these things are true. So the Barry Tabor conjecture actually says that if your quantum system belongs to a classical counterpart that is regular, then the eigenvalues, the statistics of the eigenvalues, so the spectral fluctuations of the eigenvalues, actually follow a Poissonian distribution. Um, I have to specify a bit what that means. So it's the same distribution that you would get if you look at the correlations of random numbers, uniform random numbers on an interval. So if you just say, I take a particular interval and I pick uniformly distributed random numbers, what's their correlation? 
to each other or what's the what one tends to look at is the probability distribution of the distances between these points right then that actually turns out to be an e to the minus s distribution whereas in systems whose classical counterpart is chaotic what we get is actually that we get a quite a different distribution which happens to be the same as that of eigenvalues of um, gaussian random matrices that fulfill the right symmetries of your system so in the kick top it's one of these systems which is faithful to that so i show you here just a picture we've redone it's not taken from the paper but it's similar pictures are on that paper um, where we look at the level spacing distribution. So again, we look at all the eigenvalues, you sort them, and you look at the distribution of the distances between neighboring eigenvalues. And when the system is not chaotic, so for a regime where the k is very small, we get this curve, this black curve. Here is the theory, and the blue one is our numerical data. So it's this Poissonian distribution fitting with the Barry Tabor conjecture. Whereas when it's in the chaotic regime, you basically get this green distribution. There are like small deviations, which is just limited data really, um, which is the appropriate random matrix. So a Hermitian random matrix giving you similar spectral statistics. So the, one of the reasons the kick top is so popular is that it's doing that nicely for you. Right, so this is the Hermitian kick top or the unitary kick top. So let's see what happens if we make that if you try to make that PT symmetric. So first, let me just show you how we make it PT symmetric in our particular choice. There are infinitely many choices of making this system PT symmetric, right? You introduce an additional parameter and we decided um, to make the linear term non-hemission and PT symmetric rather than this kicking term for very good reasons. <laughs> it's the first one that, that is the easiest one to look at. But it's in fact also the only one that I know how to handle at all, turns out. I mean, I want to be very honest with you here. So um, there are a lot of things we can do for this one that I'm not quite sure what you would do for the, if you, for example, went and made this K here, non-hemission. Also, if you made the K non-hemission, it wouldn't be PT symmetric because that comes with the squares. You would have to do more work and so on. So anyway, we picked the simplest one, but it's actually also it might be that the work on anything more complicated is way harder than, than what we're gonna look at here, at least analytically. Right, so this guy, if the epsilon is zero now, it's PT symmetric where um, PT, oh, I forgot to end that, where the P is LX to, so PT maps LX to LX, LY to minus LY and LZ to minus LZ, and the, also maps I to minus I. I really should have put that in the box here, but I forgot, sorry. So you can see here, if L extra stays as it is, L y doesn't feature in our Hamiltonian anyway, so you don't need to worry about that. L z flips sine, that doesn't matter here because it's a square, and here it flips sine, but the i is also flipping the sine under T symmetry, so the Hamiltonian actually is invariant under this PT operator. Um, so as we know very well, typically the eigenvalues are either real or come in complex conjugate pairs for PT symmetric systems. So now, of course, we want to look at the Floquet system. Um, what we've been doing here, and that's actually following um, a similar suggestion by work of um, Mochizuki, Kim, and Obuse um, on how to pick a time evolution such that it still stays PT symmetric. So there would always be a PT symmetry in that system, it Floquet operator, no matter how you choose your time interval. But if you want it to be the same that, that your Hamiltonian had, the best way to do that is to just pick the time interval symmetrically between the two kicks. So this thing looks a bit more complicated than the first one I showed you because we first propagate with the free evolution for half the period, then we do the kick, and then we propagate for another half period of the free evolution. So that guarantees that our Floquet operator has a PT symmetry with the same P as the Hamiltonian, right? Otherwise, you would have lots of transformations on top of it. It would still have a symmetry, but not this, the same one. So it's a bit cumbersome, but we, we decided to pick this one. Um, so the Floquet eigenvalues now, they're the eigenvalues of this Floquet operator, and they now come in um, complex, in, in, in pairs, they're either eigenvalues of modulo 1, which still sit on this circle, so that their logarithm is then purely real number, 
or they come in pairs. You can directly translate what the complex conjugation of the eigen quasi energies does to these, these guys. So they actually come in pairs that one moves in from the unit circle and the other one moves away. It might be that I missed a complex conjugation here, but it's, it's, you know, it's a quick thing to check for yourself what you would expect. So actually, we're actually not going to look at these Floki eigenways very much. We usually look back at the quasi energies, which are these I times the logarithm of these guys, which are either real or complex conjugate, just as we know it from standard PT symmetry. Yeah. Um, so now the classical limit of this, um, we actually need to think a little bit better about what we mean with that. Um, so in the standard kick top, as I said, you take the head off and evaluate classical equations of motion, but you also have the notion that expectation values of this quantum system would in the long time somehow, or in short time, somehow do similar things than the classical system. So here, if we want to do the same spirit, um, which reduces to the same classical limit in, in the unitary case, what we're looking at is the evolution of classical variables, which we interpret as the expectation values of these quantum operators. And the quantum operators are still Hermitian, remember, so this is going to be, these are going to be real numbers, okay? So we're looking at that and then we get a classical map for these guys. And now the approximation such that we can say anything about that, that anything becomes classical in this L to infinity limit, is that we're looking at states which are very well localized in phase space. So states for which these, these guys, we can always define them like that. But if you have covariances, so if you, for example, have Lx times Ly, you would like that to be as close as possible to the classical Sx types as Y. And that translates in having a state which has very small covariances, which is usually a good choice for that equivalent state. So we're taking, um, if we assume that initially our system is in an SU2 coherent state, and then we let L go to infinity and we see what happens to the classic or to this dynamics of these expectation values, we get a classical map. And the nice thing is that we made the linear part non-hemission. So the linear part actually is there's no approximation in that. If we have a coherent state and we apply to that a linear SU2 propagator, whether it has complex coefficients or not, it actually does leave it a coherent state. So there's, there's the beauty of it. So you can apply SL2 to this coherent state and you still get a SU2 coherent state out. So the linear part, we're actually not doing an approximation and the kicking part, we haven't actually altered. That's still Hermitian. So this is why what I said earlier, I'm not quite sure how to do this, how to read off the classical limit in a, a more general system. That's harder work. For us, it was very straightforward to analytically get that because we combine the kicking part. Since it's kicking, it doesn't interfere. Maybe interfering is not the right word, but it's only on for infinitely short times. So that's the nice thing about the kicking. It, it factorizes, right? So while the kicking is on, I don't have to worry about the non-hemission free evolution. And while the free evolution is on, I don't have to worry about the non-linear kicking. So we can just actually put everything together. The kick does what it used to do before. It's just the torsion around the z-axis. And the non-emission free evolution, because it's linear, we can deduce it from a two by two representation, for example. So you can do that analytically. It's not um, super beautiful. I will show it in a moment, but let me start with showing you some pictures. So when we look at this classical PT kick top, um, no, sorry, I'm showing you the linear free motion first. So this isn't the kick top yet. There's no K here. This is just the free motion of this non-hemission system. So again, we have this number of parameters. If we were in a room together, I would have written the Hamiltonian on a board for you so you'd still remember what epsilon and gamma and P are. Let me remind you. So epsilon and P are the real parameters of the linear term of our kick top, so everything's regular. And the gamma bit now is our non-hematicity parameter or PT parameter. So if epsilon is zero, we need it to be zero to be PT symmetric in the first place, but sometimes we consider the breaking, the actual, not breaking of PT, but the actual system without any PT symmetry here. So if we have a PT symmetric system and the gamma is smaller than this linear parameter, what we see in this classical dynamics is that um, this is just the dynamics of a spin one half type Hamiltonian that we still see these closed orbits and their elliptic fixed points here. 
even though the system isn't Hamiltonian. But if, just looking at these phase-based trajectories at this Hamiltonian flow, you might think well, that could be a Hamiltonian system, right? Um, when the gamma is larger than the P, so this is in the PT symmetry breaking thing, you actually get a sink and a source. I think this is the sink for that. Um, and everything flows from the sink into the source on the sphere. You can kind of see it nicely. Everything just flows there. So this is a more typical dissipative classical system, right? So if epsilon is non-zero, if there's no PT symmetry, then no matter how small the gamma is, we always get a sink in the source, okay? And we never get something like this. If we make epsilon really, really small here, there might be a tiny spiral and might take a really long time to go out of here into here, but there won't be this a system um, without sinks and sources. So in some ways, this you can kind of view this as the feature of PT symmetry in that system. And it turns out in classical chaos dynamical systems, this had actually been investigated quite a lot. Um, I hadn't really come across it because they have a slightly different name from what we call it. So what we call PT symmetry in classical dynamical system is known as reversible dynamical systems, which is a bit weird because they're not reversible, that's the whole point. They need this combined P and T, but it's been very popular in the 90s, um, it turns out. So I only learned that very recently. So when I redid this work, I didn't know about that, but um, it's, there's a lot of literature already on classical chaos with PT symmetry under a different name. Um, right, I wanna flesh up the equations so you can get the map um, explicitly. Um, as I just said, it's basically just the integration of this over a given time, right? So you, you just have this, you say you start here and then depending on how long your tour is, you rotate every trajectory up to where you need to go. But as an equation, it looks a bit cumbersome. So this is the free motion over half the period, and you have this gamma thing in here, which is a long thing in itself, so we needed a shorter name for it. So it looks a bit cumbersome, but it's not, it's not a big deal, really. It's just this torsion going around the sphere. Right? The kick itself now is what I've been saying earlier. It's just a rotation around the z-axis with an angle, which is proportional to your z-value. So what we're doing now is we're having a free motion over half the period. We're having the kick and a free motion. And obviously, you can multiply that out, but it doesn't get any prettier from that. But really, you just have one, one map, right, from step to step, but we compose it into these three different steps. So doing this, um, we get the full dynamical system. And I'll show you some pictures of that here. So in comparison, I have the unitary, so Hermitian system here. And then I switch on a little bit of non-Hermitian parameter and you can see this here still look pretty regular. And what you can see here is that there are already bifurcations going on and then a little bit of chaos already creeping up on you. If you make the um, K larger, you can see that much stronger. So this system here, there was a bit of chaos there already. And when we make it non-Hermitian, the chaos really kicks in. But it's, it's beautiful. It's sort of the unbroken PT symmetry here. Typically, this is not at all what you see in, in dissipative classical chaos. You see strange attractors, you see sinks and sources, but you don't see things like this, which would, as I say, could go down for Hamiltonian systems if you didn't look more carefully into the dynamics. Right? Right, so that's really sort of the, the, the reason for that is obviously the PT symmetry. Um, let me just show you that this is really um, a sensitive behavior or sort of a sensitive um, dependence on the initial conditions. So we also calculated the Lapinov exponents for these systems. So for these examples here where gamma gets larger, where the Lapinov exponent is blue here, that's in false colors, it's regular. So things do stay very close to each other. And where it gets, the more yellow it gets, the faster away from each other um, do these trajectories go. So it's not a big surprise, but we just wanted to check that there's not such a, some funny effect going on that, you know, things look all grisly on the, on the Poincaré plot, but it's not actually chaos. I mean, this isn't enough to call it chaos, but it definitely is the standard exponential sensitivity to initial conditions. So the gamma does make that stronger. So we make it non-emission and the chaos sets on earlier than it would otherwise. That's the first thing we observed in these systems. I really need to speed up here, sorry. <laughs> but it's mainly pictures I have for you otherwise. At some point, PT symmetry is gonna break and I actually don't know. Um, 
I'm going to mention that later again. We had a, these papers on the archive, and just before the lockdown, we had some beautiful referee reports on it with one referee who might be in the audience for all I know and was a brilliant referee giving us a lot of stuff to think about and then came the lockdown and two children at home so I haven't actually solved any of this but um, I get the very last deadline to actually submit it now and I probably should get thinking about it one of the things obviously they demanded is you know can we actually calculate whether PT symmetry breaks I don't think we can um, but you know, it would be lovely if we could. It's a you know, it's a chaotic system. It's very difficult to calculate anything analytically. But numerically, if you zoom in very, very carefully and you pay a lot of attention, you kind of see that it's not only where gamma equals p or something. It happens earlier. So like here is this sort of phase space plot I got, and then you look into the middle here and you think, what's going on there? It looks so sparse. And then you kind of zoom in and you see, oh, it, look, there's a little tiny sink and so so i reverse the the flow here so there's also the backwards propagation because this is a sink everything comes out of here and everything goes into here so i kind of just cheated i start here and i let it flow backwards as well and also if you zoom a bit then you can actually see that up here you see my cursor right yeah good so up here there's also a little bit of a spiral already where things go in so the majority of the face space is still conserved and is not being attracted in any of these things and sources but tiny ones come up already then this is just a magnification of the same thing maybe i should have showed that earlier um eventually you know as the gamma gets larger and larger there's less and less of the phase space that still remains and everything's being dragged in so here's just the poncare plot if you just propagate points for a while but now down here i show you something and this is this sort of forwards and backwards um, propagation, which is uh, zoom into here. So everything, there is little, there's a little sink here and everything actually goes into there over time. So here I show you in the bottom, you see pictures where I started a million points randomly, uniformly distributed on face space and I propagate them for, I think a hundred, a thousand and 10,000 steps, but might be something else, but something along that line. So initially, you know, things just move around still, and then they move around more and eventually everything is in this sink apart from the bit that started in that stable island. Okay, so there's one regular island here at this parameter value still, where if you start in there, you're safe, you're staying in there. But if you start anywhere else, you're gonna be stuck into this one sink, a single sink for the whole of the phase space flow. So I don't know, but I think that this island disappears when gamma is p, which is the same critical value you would have um, for the non-kicked system. But I'm not 100% sure because this is entirely based on numerics and you know, you can always zoom in more and you never really know what the infinity limit is. But you know, some stuff is going on and some of that is probably what you expect from a PT symmetric chaotic system. If the kicking is very stronger, so that everything is already chaotic when it's non when it's emission and unitary we see something that's actually a bit more familiar from from deterministic chaos uh, sorry from yeah from deterministic dissipative chaos and that's a, what i believe to be a strange attractor i can only say it sort of looks like a strange attractor it smells like a strange attractor it probably is one you know? i again it's difficult very difficult to prove that something is a strange attractor and it's sort of going a bit beyond what we're trying to do here um, and looking at this guy, so we make the gamma larger and you can see it come out more and more clearly. Looking at this, that's the reason I flagged up this, this classical picture of the dynamics earlier, because what we see here, it turns out, is simply um, the, 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 so the, the skeleton of this attractor is really the one-time iteration of the classical map. So I show you that here. So here, even when gamma is zero, if you propagate the classical map for these parameters once, the, the great circle, you get exactly this skeleton. So now if you uh, switch on the gamma for that, you can kind of see, um, no, this is a larger gamma, sorry. Here down here, I have the counterpart for these parameter values. And up here, I see, show you this sort of strange attractor. So you really see what comes out is, is this, one-time iteration that you see as the backbone of this. Using this is quite nice because you can calculate where the like center of this spiral is, how often it winds around and so forth. It's, it's very easy to by just looking at the one-time iteration. 
and you can see that if you change the parameters around, the, you know, it changes quite a lot how it looks like. Right, so as I said, it does look very much like a strange attractor. It does seem to have a fractal structure. I just zoomed in a little bit to show you. I didn't do a box counting. Maybe I should, but it looks very much like a strange attractor. Um, with a sort of slightly non-trivial weighting, you know, you can see it's sort of slightly less dense in the bottom bit, and that's getting stronger the larger gamma goes because it sort of tends to spend more time where we would expect there to be a sink if there was a sink. There is no sink. It really keeps on going on on this as long as we can observe it. It never stops sitting, uh, running around, you know, jumping around on that structure. Right, there's something else in the classics I need to talk about. I know I only have about five more minutes, but I do want to tell you that quickly, which you don't have in, in standard um, classical dynamical systems because we also have a norm of our quantum state, right? And this does have a classical counterpart. You can look at, the, um, at this quantity in the limit that L is very large, and that gives you something like a classical norm. It's a bit weird. Um, you could kind of interpret, if, if you interpret it as a system like a laser system or something, it really is an amplitude, right? It's an intensity that you have on top of where you're going in phase space. So this has a very complicated dynamic. So in every point in phase space, obviously it locally grows or decays exponentially. But it, since it jumps around on phase space, you know, the time evolution of this thing as a function for initial point, you have functions for every initial point. So to actually uh, visualize that, we decided to actually look at the norm after a certain number of iterations as a function of the initial condition. So let me just show you some pictures that you tend to get when you do something like that. So this here is the first line is all for the same parameters in the, in the regular regime. So if you do that for five steps, 10 steps, 20 steps, as I said, in false colors, you see the norm after five steps, 10 steps or 20 steps, if you start your classical system in this particular point in phase space, right? So if I start here, the norm is growing. If I start here, the norm is decaying over time. And as, if you do that longer, we weren't quite sure what's the right time to look at. It turns out that the picture doesn't really change that much, but you get a lot of additional fine structure the longer you wait, the more fine structure you get, but the same features kind of are still there. In this chaotic region where we had a strange attractor, you can beautifully see the same attractor coming out in the dynamics. And the longer you wait, the, the finer you resolve this fractal structure of it. So that's something you don't have in standard classical dynamical systems because the, the variable is just not there. Right, let me just spend these three minutes <laughs> on the, we did start a bit late, didn't we? <laughs> but people might still have to move on. So let me try to wrap it up as quickly as I can. So what about the quantum features now? We have already introduced the quantum Hamiltonian and the Fluke operator. So let's look at the standard stuff, eigenvalues, Cosimi distributions, and then let's wrap up. So the eigenvalues, let me just show you an example. Um, if you start out again with something which is of still fairly regular and you put in a small non-emission parameter, you can see that the eigenvalues start going away from the real axis. So what you have to keep in mind is that these are quasi energies. So they're really logarithm of something that is a phase, right? So they will, when they reach minus one or one, they will start wrapping up on each self, uh, each other again a little bit. So they're not, um, sorry, that's in the real direction. So the ones that go out here or go out here, they're sort of gonna start wrapping up. So they don't have a natural, real order really. But anyway, you see they're moving away from the real axis as it happens for non-emission or PT symmetric systems. Now, if the system was chaotic to start with and we open it up way less, they just shoot off the real axis and in a very irregular way. So I quite like these pictures because I feel like if you look at them, looking at these or these, you could kind of tell without doing any calculation that this has probably been chaotic beforehand and this was probably regular before you open it up. So it's kind of nice. Um, but it also shows you these numbers are way smaller than the numbers I looked at in the classical system. And that's because the quantum system is extremely sensitive to small perturbations, which is typical for PT and non-emission systems again. So unfortunately, we can't actually do numerics in the region very interested in, and that's not us. That's because computer accuracy, machine accuracy is not enough to resolve the eigenvalues. So I'll give you an example of what goes wrong. Um, you might actually not see it. So this is just a warning. If anyone is using non-emission matrices, large ones, or even not so large ones, this is 400 by 400. 
a lot can go wrong. This system, you might look at that and say, oh, fine, eigenvalues. But we know analytically they have to be PT symmetric, but these here are not. You see, there's like this guy, there's no partner. There's this one, no partner to them. So this spectrum here is, is nonsense. They are random numbers, really. So if we start analyzing those, we get what we expect for random numbers, right? So this is not the spectrum. Unfortunately, that's a limitation. We can only look at very, very small values of gamma um, in the quantum system because it's extremely sensitive. Um, there's a lot to say about that, but I won't right now. <laughs> let me just say that where we can, oh, sorry, let me show you some Huzimis. So where it's been very regular and there are just very few that are off the real axis, you can look at this classic of base space, you look the, at the Huzimi functions of the eigenfunctions and they fit with these sort of classical structures very well. There are some things that are different here because it knows it's not exactly a Hamiltonian system, but it fits. So um, in the, this very chaotic system, where we had this strange attractor, again, perhaps not surprise, we find this strange attractor in the quantum eigenstates again. It's not actually the eigenstates themselves because they're highly non-orthogonal, so you need to kind of look at invariant subspaces. That's well established by work of Henning Schomeros, actually, um, using what he calls the Husimi Shure representation. Should have really put in a reference, but I'm saying it. So Henning Schumeros and his student Martin Kopp, they introduced this Husimi Shure representation a while ago for other open systems. And that you can really see it very well. So what we look at here is the, the quantum Husimi distribution is here, and this classical lifetime distribution I showed you before. And even, even the sort of color saturation, even though these two color schemes mean something completely different, but you can see variations in there that fit nicely. So these two concepts, these two things are clearly related to each other. No one really knows how exactly, you know, how to translate that into a quantization rule for chaotic open systems or something, but they're clearly related. Right, final thing. I I'm I don't know, Andreas doesn't even look that nervous now, but I'm getting nervous time-wise. Um, let me try to wrap it up as quickly as I can. So the spectral take statistics. Your time. Take your time. Yeah? Yeah, take your right. time. So I do have two more slides. So two more slides, and this is an interesting aspect. It's, um, but I don't understand it, <laughs> okay? So maybe someone else does. So when you want to look at these spectral statistics, something I hadn't mentioned before in the unitary system is that you need to unfold your eigenvalues. You know, when we talk about universality in, in quantum chaos, we really mean that you have to sit, put your system through a lot and a lot and a lot of machinery before you can extract something that's actually universal, okay? So something that looks the same in every system is very well hidden in the system. And one thing you have to do is that you actually have to what's called unfolding the eigenvalues. So you need to bring you want to only look at the fluctuations of the eigenvalues around a mean, and the mean is very strongly influenced by the specific features of your system. So you need to kind of divide your eigenvalues um, into a smooth and a fluctuating bit, okay? That's pretty common, I guess, in science, but um, the problem is if you just have data from a system, you don't really know which is which, okay? So it's, there are well-established methods for real eigenvalues on, the, on, on one line, on an interval. For complex ones, it's a 2D thing. There are different ways people have used. There have only been a handful of models that people had looked at so far, and they're different ways. We are quite lucky because it's still a quantum map, which actually implies that the, the real part of these quasi energies is almost uniformly distributed. So if we don't make the PT too bad, we don't have to worry too much about that, and we can use that to, un, to unfold the imaginary part. And then what we do is we study the nearest neighbor distances in the complex plane. That also follows Hake and others in the 90s. Um, that, that seems to be the best thing, you know, if you, don't, if you have real eigenvalues, you sort them and you look at their, their distances. They're complex, you can't sort them. So the best sort of substitute for that is actually to look at the, the nearest neighbor spacings. Okay, so the expectation of what we would expect for that from PT perspective would be probably that that should be modeled by some sort of PT symmetric random matrix model. One candidate that we had in mind was the real Geneva ensemble for those who know which one that is. The expectation from open chaotic systems that had been studied before, that sort of Lindner type systems, is that you expect when they're regular, you expect a two-dimensional Poisson distribution 
And when they're complex, uh, when they're chaotic, you expect another ensemble, which is the so-called complex Geneva. So what we find is this here. So let me show you that. So for the regular case, uh, it's a bit stupid. We called it GOE. It's really the 2D Poisson distribution. They happen to be the same distribution. Okay, so our data for this kick top non-hemission, so lots of complex eigenvalues, it does fit the expectation from other open quantum chaos that the regular case lays on this green curve. When it's chaotic, what we find is that it, it fits quite nicely with the purple curve or the pink curve. I have to say here, the, the, the right side here is the integrated spacing. So where we have the histogram here, if we now integrate that, we get a nice smooth curve so we can compare a little bit better. So it fits quite nicely with this pink curve which is not quite what the systems. We first actually thought it was, but there's some subtlety in there. I don't really want to um, bore you with that, but the bottom line is so there, there are a few observations we made. So the spectrum has a very clear PT symmetry, right? So we can see the symmetry in the spectrum, obviously complex conjugate pairs. But when you look at nearest net fixed, there is my autocorrect thinks I'm American. Anyway, so, um, when you look at the nearest neighbor spacings, um, then they're actually not significantly influenced by the PT symmetry at all. So if we break PT symmetry, we get pretty much the same figures as these here. So not broken in the sense of complex eigenvalues, but broken in the sense that the system doesn't even have the symmetry when we put our epsilon in which some people have in the meantime discussed in, in various papers that because sort of the symmetry is like a global thing on the spectrum and the nearest neighbors is a very local quantity that might not see this. Anyway, what we're finding in the chaotic regime is that it follows this two by two complex Geneva statistics, but in fact, following again our brilliant referee, I finally read um, the paper um, by Hamasaki Kawabata and Ueda on non emission and PT symmetric random matrices and their um, universality classes. I haven't had the time to check yet, but I think, in fact, it's not this. It's not what I've been saying here, but it's another class, um, symmetry class, that they identified for PT symmetric systems in their very recent work. And that would be pretty cool because um, they only look really at random matrix models. And you know what we are looking at here is another physical model and there are very very few out there that have been studied so it, it might be that what we've discovered here is sort of a recently identified um, universality class for for pt symmetric systems um, to check that we don't just observe that in our particular model we actually checked a number of other systems one of them is also a map but it's not a hamiltonian map so it just comes from a standard quantum map that we made PT symmetric. And the other one is a Hamiltonian system that's very high dimensional that we made non-hemission. So they have almost nothing in common, these systems, and they all show the same stuff. So it very much looks as if there's some universality going on in a slightly unexpected way from my perspective, but there might be a good reason for that when one thinks about symmetries. And I think with that, I really stretched the time enough. Let me just show you the outline slide again for a summary. I introduced to the standard kick top for those who didn't know it or to set the scene. I then introduced this PT symmetric version we cooked up, showed you how it behaves in the classical limit or as a, yeah, the classical counterpart, and then showed you the quantum, some of the quantum features of it. Um, unfortunately, we can't go everywhere we want to go with it, but um, there's a lot of correspondence where you would expect it. With that, I thank you for your attention. No? First, I ask you to have a look at the preprint, sorry, and then I thank you for your attention and stay safe. But I do want to say one last thing before we go to questions. Um, on a completely different note, those of you who still have an income are the lucky ones, and you might know that charities have struggled a lot in the recent situation, and that a lot of inequalities that are around for a long time have been amplified a lot by the current crisis and um, there's not that much I can do about this I thought but one thing I might be able to do is starting some fundraising and I've done set myself a running and cycling challenge 
me that I've almost finished. I'm meant to do a long run um, on Saturday as my grand finale thing. So if you do have, you know, something to spare, go and donate for any charity of your choice. Perhaps the one I'm fundraising for, which is a brilliant charity that um, mainly supports projects to help children all around the world in very difficult circumstances or anywhere else. You know, as I said, if you're among the lucky ones that still has an income, we might not, of course, not all of us might be, but you know, might be a good time to, to think about this. Right. And I'm happy to take questions then. Thank you, Eva Maria. Thank you very much. Questions? <clears throat> Anyone has a question? I, I have one. Duncan, have one. yeah, go ahead, Duncan, Duncan. Um, I, I was trying to get some intuition for, for what's going on in your system and why, why the, the non-hermission system should be more chaotic. And so I, I guess, you know, there's, there's various conserved quantities for the Hermitian system that you then lose when you make it non-Hermitian. And so that, that's, that, that's in line with the idea that um, you know, chaotic systems, you don't have enough conserved quantities mm -hmm. as the degrees of freedom. But then I would have expected a, a change when the, when the PT symmetry is broken, but that I, I guess I... I couldn't quite keep up with all the all the various cases you you discussed, but did you see a change in the in the degree of chaos? Well, it's, it's slightly tricky. So in in some, it really depends a little bit where we started. Whether we already started in this regime where even without PT symmetry, it was already quite chaotic, and then we do just get this this strange attractors, which in some ways, you know, they're still chaotic. But it's the standard thing you would you would see for for dissipative chaos. In in the other ones, it's slightly tricky because once you get this dissipative motion, well, in some ways you could say so, right? Once you have a sink and everything just goes into that sink, it's not really chaotic flow anymore, right? So because if it was chaotic, the chaotic version of that would be an attractor, not a single sink. Um, yes. So so to some degree, yes. I'm not quite sure. You're right. You know, that's what you would think about the symmetry. But of course, we have this parameter epsilon, which is the same we make complex that already breaks one of the symmetries. And, you know, that doesn't actually influence where the chaos sets on if you just make it real. Another thing that I also have to disclose here is that we have, I, I was really, I really like this idea that, you know, like in the chaos, it's more sensitive and you make it non-emission and it becomes more chaotic. We have been studying the kick rotor recently. And and we don't, we don't observe the same behavior there. So I wouldn't actually say that this is hugely universal in, in that sense. Yeah, so there we actually observed in some regions, we observed that um, when it, at least what we saw there is that the spectrum was less um, sensitive to the non-emission bit when it was chaotic than when it was regular. So, you know, this last picture I showed you. And in the classical dynamics, it's very different there because we made it PT symmetric in a way that in fact, there are never any sinks or sources. So the classical PT symmetry never seems to be broken in that sense, whereas the quantum one breaks. So the eigenvalues all become complex. I think I, it's, you know, I, I think that's the reason why systems like that are important to study because we need to build up some intuition but it's also probably important not to put too much emphasis on a single one. And the difference because is that there yeah. is having a, a finite sized phase space versus an infinite phase well, space. Well, here I also, I mean, actually in both of them, we have an infinite sized phase space because we put the kick rotor on a torus, oh. what we've been doing there. And this is on a sphere. We've also looked at, um, well, the Baker map was also on that. Um, we've been looking at, a kicked harmonic oscillator on an infinite one, but we don't have half as many results on that one. So I wouldn't really want to make it. We're starting to look at billiards now. So to, to get more, you know, to get the full like arsenal of systems really. Um, because I think we probably need to look at a few more before we actually can kind of figure out what's going on. So if you just had the sink, it would be less chaotic? Yeah, I, I would think, uh, would say so, right? Like in classical, dissipative chaos if it's an individual sink you wouldn't really call that chaos i mean 
the damp out the system. You know, it's just everything going there. I mean, of course, you could still look at the Lakhonov between initial things, but eventually they all go into the sink. Whereas what we saw when it was quite chaotic to start with, this strange attractor, I mean, this is dissipative chaos, right? Because it's everything is attracted to the attractor, but once it's on there, it keeps on jumping around chaotically. So there, actually, the chaos did not get less with the anonymity. You know, I mean, I mean, it's a, it really, it really... It seems to be rather complex, I mean, in the, in this sort of standard sense, not, not in the imaginary sense. Thank you. <laughs> Miloslav, you have a question. Um, yeah. <clears throat> my, my comment is on this transition from classical to, to PT symmetrical regime, where I remember your paper with, with Uwe and many others on Boza Hubar mm -hmm. from 2008. Yeah. When the conclusion was that if you include this type of uh, perturbation, which is proportional to square of Z, so the spectrum is always yes. complex. Uh, so in, some, in this sense, this is the, the, the perturbation which is very strong because it, it breaks the reality of and unitarity of the system. So if you distinguish between open systems and closed systems, when there is uh, on one hand uh, this philosophy of everything being complexified, so if you decide to use weaker kicks, my question is, what would result? If you use weaker kicks... So you mean with, with weaker, you uh, mean not LZ squared, rather than a smaller K, right? No, no, I mean the type of... Uh, yeah, the type of... Break break the reality of the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, yes. it was examples in, in this paper in 2008 when there were uh, stars of, 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 of eigenvalues. So that's something which is a consequence of this perturbation being yeah. very strong for whatever K. I mean, if you use another operator for kicking, yes. that's my question. Did um, you try? Well, I mean, you need to use one for the quantum chaos, so that is actually becoming chaotic as well, right? So if you use a linear one, it won't make it chaotic. So it might still be, you know, an interesting question for other things, but... Um, no, we haven't, is the short answer. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it is the counterpart. It's the same thing that we did with Uwe, who's here, right? He's somewhere there. Um, with Uwe, you know, then, but with the time dependence in front of the nonlinear term. So the, um, the now, I mean, it's sort of, it, it's not as bad as the other one because it's not constantly switched on. You know, it's only intermittently switched on, which makes it not break everything as badly is there but as i as we also noticed there you know actually getting numerical results there we could do a lot analytically here we can't because it's chaotic but do we getting numerical results for these is is bad because i think that's actually not because of the kicking that's because of, of the fact that without the kicking the linear one is very higher high order exceptional points yeah, so in exactly. fact all the all the eigenvalues yeah, yeah, yeah. coalesce at one point so it's extremely sensitive to perturbations right yeah, that's point, yes. i mean most people would probably argue that perhaps we shouldn't look at the eigenvalues at all because if they're so sensitive in real life you know it's, it's also sensitive so they actually tend to tell you less about the system's behavior if they're very sensitive, so we might just look at other things, right? In fact, maybe we should all get away a bit from this whole focus on eigenvalues. No, maybe we should study other things. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're standard things to look at, you know, singular values, um, pseudo spectra, you know, all these sort of things. That's but also another aspect this pseudo spectrum because it goes the same way. I mean, with pseudo spectra, you come to con working not in that's important aspect but yeah i mean i guess this one here is is in this sense of the you know this lx y z being real still you know we're using the standard dirac in the product we're not using pt yeah, yeah, in that I sense i understand um, that if i may have another question you know we i cannot be too too long <laughs> so um, so your diagram where those i gave you turn off of the real line. It reminded me of, of, of people who studied um, PT symmetrical band spectra, in which broken PT symmetry means that also those, those um, um, again, we use moving uh, strange curves, 
of the real mind. So it reminds me of the... Yeah, I the think, I mean, I've been talking a little bit to spectral analysis people who are trying to solve these questions, and there seems to be a little bit of a conjecture going around that I don't think is, you know, has been actually been sort of phrased too explicitly, but there seems to be this suspicion going around that if a system is integrable, that these complex eigenvalues sort of lie on one dimensional yeah. spaces in the complex plane, which you can kind of see here, right? I mean, obviously there's a finite number of points. You can always draw a line through them, right? I mean, you can't say, but whereas if you look at this, you get this sense, you know, that they're actually on lines. Whereas if you look at this deer, they're clearly kind of filling up areas. So there, there seems to be stuff like that being, you know, coming, evidence coming from lots of directions. But this is, it's very exciting times to be doing PD symmetry, I think. <laughs> There's so much going on oh, that, that could be related. Thank you, Miloslav. Frida has a question. Thank you. Just for curiosity, um, in the times when they started treating chaos and quantum physics, um, they always look parallelly also to such structures like fractals. And when you entered the chaos, there was a ordering uh, of the chaos, uh, which was called self-similarity. Mm -hmm. So uh, you sometimes see small uh, details which look like the great picture. The question is, um, does this uh, self-similarity uh, persist when you are in PT symmetric regimes? Or uh, does it, is it killed when you uh, uh, go into P PT symmetry breaking or PT yeah. symmetry regimes? I don't know. I mean, I only can show you this one example. So yeah, this strange attractor here does, as far as I, I can't vouch for it, you know, but I, it seems to have a fractal structure. So this structure here, you know, if you zoom into this, so you have, this is the whole picture. Now you zoom into, I should have made a little thing and you see the same sort of pattern repeating and you zoom 10 times more and you see the same thing repeating. So that's sort of the typical thing, you know, it's only a strange attractor if it does have a fractal geometry, which um, this is only pictorial evidence that it does and this is a pt symmetric system and the pt symmetry is broken in the sense that while well, the quantum system i can't even calculate the eigenvalues but i have every reason to believe they're fully complex and there isn't anything we left and in the classical system you know it's an attractor it's not conservative it looks just like dissipated but dynamics is it in the whole so chaotic system or is it in the whole chaotic phase space or is it only it, in certain regions well it's chaotic on the attractor which is sort of what you expect from the more standard dissipated classical chaos so the point is what happens is you know the whole phase space is this whole square but after a very short time, every point ends up on this darker structure here. And once it's on that structure, it's, it continues randomly hopping around on it. And the structure itself seems to be fractal. I mean, as I said, I can't guarantee it would be a bit weird if it's not because it, it looks to be. In self-similar, yeah? Yeah, I mean, self-similar in that sense here. If you zoom in, you can see this lot of things. But as I said, it's just a pictorial evidence, but it seems to be fine. Um, but of course, what, what doesn't, I mean, here in this sort of more standard, these PT ones, I'm not quite sure. You wouldn't really see it in the dynamical aspect. You would have to look at another feature, probably. I mean, it's a dynamical aspect there, but you probably need to look at a different feature to see something fractal. But I don't see why there shouldn't be something fractal. Let's put it that way. Thanks, Frida. Any more questions? Yes, uh, um, I, I, Andreas, I would like- Joshua, to, uh, Joshua, go uh, ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, a, a brief question for understanding. So Eva, th first of all, thank you for the lovely talk and the beautiful pictures. Uh, now, uh, since you're kicking uh, the kinetic energy, this uh, LZ square, uh, if you took expectation values of the Hamiltonian, in consecutive states, you would probably see that the energy uh, in, is increased uh, progressively, right? Um, I, I mean, again, because if you look at the energy, because it jumps up and down on the phase space, 
I don't no, think no, no, so. but, 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 but the kick, the kick is in the kinetic energy. It is, so, but as you can yeah. see, you know, look, you know, you might just start here and you jump back and forth. So at each of these points, here, all that goes smaller and larger, right? Uh, but this, that's phase And phase. also it's bounded because the phase space is, yeah, is fine. It's, it's compact. Yeah. So it can't, okay. it can't so, continuously increase. I mean, eventually it will have to stop. In, it, but I haven't looked at it. Go on, okay. sorry. So, uh, <laughs> so coming on. back to what uh, actually Miroslav asked you, so what would happen? I, I, also, I understand that this kicking, uh, I mean, people have been doing it uh, since the mid 80s with Hackel's paper about the top, uh, yes. if I understood yes. you correctly. So, what would happen if we kicked uh, the linear term, for example, in the, in the kick rotor? In the kick rotor, you uh, don't kick the kinetic energy, you kick the angle, which is mm -hmm. conjugate to the. Uh, I, to the I mean, uh, I'm not sure that I. I agree that the L is greater than the kinetic energy because, of course, the LX, I mean, it depends on how you yeah, 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 okay. I mean, the quadratic, the quadratic, quadratic and momentum. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are two answers. I mean, um, there's one answer that if you just kick the other one, but you still have the LZ, it's actually the same system. It's just related by unitary transformation. So you could as well keep the LZ square term constant and kick the other one. That looks, that's the same system. Um, but of course, you might be asking, what, what I think you to ask is, what if I keep the linear system and then I don't even have the nonlinear no, one, no, but no, I no, put no, in no. some other no, thing, no, right? No, no, I, ju I just meant kicking, let's say, LX or yes. L, uh, or, and, or even... Uh, and, yeah. not, and not having an LZ squared at all. No, 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 not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, uh, so if you, uh, so I didn't get what you said uh, uh, at the beginning uh, of your last answer. So, uh, so what? So could you describe? Uh, has anybody checked that? Uh, do you know the answer for? I don't know the answer to that. Um, if you look for the operator here, what you see, what I first said, but I don't think that's your question. Is if you now, it doesn't really matter if you kick this term or this term. That's equivalent, right? Because it would just be a scaling, you know, whether you put a tor here or here, mm. you know. So um, if you have the nonlinear term and the linear one, it doesn't matter which of the two you kick, you get the same floquet up to unitary transformations. But I think your question is more that if I keep this guy yeah. and now I put in an LZ here, for example, right? Okay. So if you did that, then you can kind of again looking at this see that there wouldn't be any chaos or anything like that because it's a complete integrable system, it's all SU2. So you need to do something severe to it to, you know, so that your Floke operator isn't an SU2 generator. So LZ squared in some ways is actually the least, you know, the least okay. you can come up with. Um, yeah, if you just um, have a linear one, you just get an integrable model, which- I see, know, so, so in general, in general if, 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 if you had a, not necessarily SU2, uh, any, any group, if you just kick along one of the generators, you would eventually um, uh, carry uh, diffusion along the group. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, um, I don't want to, again, vouch for anything that I haven't been thinking through in great detail, but I'd be surprised because it, it, you know, it looks like a kicking that in the Floke operator, it's simply a group action, right? So if that yeah. was the square, you're not okay. actually doing anything bad to your system. It's fully, I think it should be fully integrable, but I might be missing something. Um, so now in the SU2, you're quite limited with what you can do. This is why, right, because, you know, LZ, then there's LZ squared. There would be LX, LY, they kind of do the same thing. Right? Yeah. Um, okay. So there's not that many you can do, but you're right. This is one reason that we're trying to look at other systems, like the kick rotor or something, where you can, where you have some, a bit more freedom of, of what you, you know, what you're actually kicking, what you do. And a kick term yeah. on it was to say, they, they all, of course, as you know very well, they all have their very, specific properties yes. mm -hmm. uh, you know each of them carries very specific properties yeah, yeah. The yeah, PC. this is probably and the place why we should investigate all of them you know just to oh, right but uh, <laughs> for that you need infinite amount of resources uh, uh, another uh, comment or uh, uh, suggestion is that in the kick throttle uh, there is nice the, the uh, people were very careful to uh, determine uh, at least numerically the critical K or kicking uh, kicking uh, coupling. Uh, yes. So and, and there was nice mathematical uh, work by people like Green, uh, Green with an E in the end. Yeah. Uh, how to how to pinpoint it, uh, etc. 
Do you have any idea what is the critical K in your case? Well, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I mean, Hake and others have calculated it, but um, the problem is that it's a gradual thing to chaos, a bit like, I mean, for the kicked rotor, there, there's sort of, at least there's one bifurcation that you kind of can associate. Sorry, this is the one I mentioned with it. So in the kick top, it's slightly harder to pinpoint a particular value. Sorry. Um, you know, clearly it happens somewhere between here, but it really it yeah, yeah. depends on which of the orbits you, you demand to break. So I think, you know, I made the P slightly unusual. It depends on what you put that there. But, but, you know, there are estimates for each of these. So, you know, for this series of fixed point bifurcations, at which point you, know, you start okay. calling it chaotic. So, in fact, in this unitary system, you can calculate quite a lot of it analytically. You can really calculate a series of critical K values at which different fixed points bifurcate, which we were maybe not skillful enough to do in the non-emission, but it well, certainly is harder, you know, it is harder because you have to, the math is just not as pretty. Well, of course, yeah. numerically is much harder. Uh, yeah, even, you know, analytically we might be able to, but because the map is such a monster, you know, whereas yeah. the, the unitary model, it might be that we're just looking at the wrong representation of it, you know, we might be looking in the wrong variables or something, it, there might be something hidden that's very neater, but I can't quite see it. So in the, we, we haven't been quite able to calculate the same sort of, you can see the bifurcations, obviously, and, you know, probably there's a way to calculate mm -hmm what happens you know what happens here you know when this when this orbit here and these mm -hmm. islands appear and so on but um we haven't but yeah so in principle in the unitary one there, there's lots of analytic values for the different critical parameters okay thank you very much mm -hmm. maybe a last question if there is If yeah, not, if, uh, yeah, it's it's Uwe. 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 Hi, yes. Uwe. Good to <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, hi to everybody. I'm just wondering, did you try to somehow uh, look at the kind of complementary representation, not using the SU2 representation as a new case, but uh, SU11 representation, which would be natural for PT inner product? Mm. Oh, um. would these chaotic uh, structures there come out? Might, it might happen that there could be some additional information or some uh, intuition getting from these pictures. Do that's you think it's realistic or is it... Uh... That, that's a very rich question because there's so many... I, I already, you know, just from the top of my head, I can come up with lots of ways of implementing and interpreting, interpreting it. Um, we I'm just wondering. So. Yeah, we haven't really... Uh, I mean, there are many ways in which that could come out. As, as you know, you know, one you know everyone you all all you guys know me long enough to not to not talk about the fact that this is in the you know that lx well, z and y are real and that it's not the complex hamilton's equations and so on i mean that's one of the natural one one could of course look at and i mean um for example joshua and carl have done that for the kick road right that you could look at the complexified classical dynamics of it on lx l y l z being complex but that's not quite i mean that would be sl Two really right, so that would be kind of getting you a complexified Bloch sphere rather than an SU one one like hyperboloid. That that would be one. Then, but another one would of course be kind of thinking. Um, there was another one I just had in my mind, but yeah. But the, the short answer is no. I haven't concretely been thinking about that in this particular context. But it's oh, probably okay. a very good thing to think about. Uh, intuition tells it. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Thank you. If there's nothing else, then um, let's thank Eva Maria again. Yeah, thank you very much thank for you. the nice talk. Thank you, guys, and see you soon. <laughs> Stop sharing. Stop. Bye, everybody. <laughs>